Hello everybody, welcome back to the CSFL kickoff show. Of course we have an action packed episode for you guys today. We're going to be talking through pre-season GM polls, getting your live reaction to how you think your teams are doing. We're going to be breaking down the week one action that landed yesterday, as well as talking strategy, playbooks and of course our CSFL GM bite. All that and more to come on the show today. Let's get into it. Right, on today's episode, let's just get straight into some of the action, some of the talking points um, for for this week. First thing we need to talk a little bit about is the, the pre season survey poll that we sent around to everyone. First of all, I have to probably say thank you so much to every GM who took the time to just fill in the, the couple of questions that we aren't we asked you guys. It's given us some really insightful discussion here, and, and we can we're going to break that down in a moment. But it was really fantastic to see that we had 20 GMs fill in the poll. So thank you very much for doing that. It's quite short notice, but we'll try and break down. It gives us some interesting topics of discussion to have um, in a moment. And where better to probably start on this one? Than with the um, the general the first question we, we kind of asked you guys, which was how many wins do you think your team is going to have this season? And well, as you can probably see from this, there's a big percentage of people who are kind of sitting in that eight to ten game range, which is, is probably expected. Most most teams seem to give the uh, the view that they feel that they're going to be in and around the playoff mix, which. It's really great to feel that it's you know going to be a really competitive season. Everyone's sort of vying for that playoff spot. There was nobody who obviously went sort of beyond the twelve win mark, which uh, you know nobody <laughs> nobody put in the unbeaten run like the Titans from last season. But it's really it's, it's great to see that most people sort of sitting in that in that middle pack where they feel they're going to be hunting for the playoffs. There were some there were some realists amongst amongst the uh, the GMs this year. A couple of guys feeling that they'll probably be under sort of the six to three win mark. Um, a lot of um, noise that came out from that was mainly because they're new to the league or they feel their team's going for a rebuilding period. And we'll try and break down some of those those comments in a moment. But I just thought we'd start with this one just to give a bit of a flavour for, for where teams are. And it's, you know, it gives us a sense that, you know, teams are going to sort of really, are really thinking realistic about their expectations and not just assuming they're going to come in and, 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 and dominate, for example. So the next question we kind of asked you guys, which was, you know, give us a flavour for, you know, a couple of words or, th or something about how you feel your team is going to do. And of course, we've turned that into a li little bit of a word cloud here. I mean, big thing, obviously, is playoffs. It kind of ties back to the number of wins that the teams think they're going to possibly achieve this year. That seems to be the main sort of big sticking point. A lot of guys talking about, you know, thinking about ne next year already and think about draft pick looking obviously towards the season ahead and possibly how the division is going to be quite competitive I mean, to give you a flavor for some of the uh, the actual verbatim comments which is really interesting uh, there was a, a, a great comment from one gm in terms of thinking that um you know basically they don't, the team doesn't have a lot of franchise players and you know the draft pick is going to probably end up being a mediocre so um you know resulting in a very mediocre quarterback so the sign of mediocrity from one gm which is, is interesting to sort of point out um a couple of guys thinking that uh you know it's going to be hard to get past some of the competition that's in their division so citing teams like the titans the lions the Chargers, all teams that were in the playoffs last year thinking it's going to be very difficult to try and uproot that that division title possibly um a lot of people sort of generally commenting a little bit on on play, playbooks and developing that as well, revamping certain areas of the team. So we talked about quarterbacks, talked about you know wide receivers as well, and how that's probably something some teams have been looking at. Um, so it's really interesting to see. I mean, a couple of other things on here. Disappointment was one that stood out. So someone actually wrote they think they're going to have a disappointing season already. So probably uh, tempering their own expectations there as well. But real, real invigoration um, coming through in terms of teams thinking that maybe they, they're getting new blood, they're sort of getting a sense in terms of building towards a wild card or playoff or, or winning games. Big thing came out was in terms of um, good defence as well. Teams, a couple of teams commenting that 
they felt they you know the defense hopefully this year will be the thing that steps up for them and a lot of lot of teams actually commenting on that which is was an interesting observation so that's uh, that gives you a bit of, hopefully a bit of a sense in terms of what the feeling is for for just general comments and things um i'm not i'm not going to go through the details probably of talking specifically about every single gm comment um it's it's always good to get leave a bit of that that hidden because some some of them are quite quite brutal some of them are quite honest and uh you know i'll leave those gms to kind of share their expectations as the season progresses as to where where they think they are um but it's good that we've got a sense of teams probably fighting for playoffs and a sense of some guys re- realizing that they probably do need to develop a little bit in terms of their understanding of the game and i'm sure there were people around on the server and and obviously on these videos talking about how you can try and sort of learn as you go along through the season and hopefully by the end of it come out as a better coach and gm and, and really starting to see how how you how how fascinating this game is really and then finally i guess the main question that everyone's probably been waiting for from this survey is just in terms of what do gms think um is going to happen in terms of the end goal which is the super bowl who do they think is going to win the csfl this year and well it was um it was fairly resounding i have to say um in in the respect of that um so let's uh let's just get ourselves over to that one and uh and just talk a little bit about that so no surprise i guess um the lions have, have been a team that have been up the, the top end of the, the csfl for a, a fair, fairly long period of time now but the consensus i guess was really overwhelming over 50 percent of the uh the gms on the survey felt that the the lions were going to win the csfl this year so big expectations there for the lions i, I mean you could probably see the, the awesome season preview that, that that josh on the server did for the uh the AFC North, but uh, essentially outlining that probably this Lions team is not as talented as previous Lions teams, but given the fact that they, they didn't win the Super Bowl this year and won it the previous year, still means that there is that mentality to try and win this year. And it seems like the GMs of the league kind of agree with that. Elsewhere, I mean, it's really interesting that the, uh, no, really interesting that probably the one that stands out for me is the New York Jets, um, obviously a new GM. Um, one team, couple of guys in particular felt that the Jets would probably be there or thereabouts still this year, despite the um, the transition of roster and the transition of GM. So that was an interesting one from my perspective. And then the other ones, I guess, are not really too surprising for me. I mean, we talked about Dallas um, previously, but obviously landing Cam Newton last year, the ability to use playbooks again this year for for um, for the Gorilla and, and the Dallas Cowboys is going to be huge fully expect them to be up there they were up there just before that period anyway so they're probably going to be fighting out talked about the rams i mean jared goff and and eddie potato got a fantastic situation there and i i'm sure that they will be thinking that they are contenders this year as well dolphins i've talked a lot about as well previously in terms of ben roffelsberger and, and john the gm there is probably going to be focusing on on contending as well this year they've probably got some of the right pieces in place now as well as obviously Tampa with Rogers um, arriving, there's big expectations there, and a couple of GMs feeling that, that that move probably is going to be the one that brings the uh, the Buccaneers the title this year. He's obviously injured at the moment, and we'll talk a bit about the the Week One recap uh, just after this. But Tampa obviously got big expectations this year, and then finally the Tennessee Titans, obviously unbeaten last season, roster still intact change of quarterback but a lot of the defensive um, ability has, has definitely been upgraded over the offseason and quite a few GMs do agree that they think the Titans are going to be there or thereabouts this season. So that brings us to a conclusion of the, the GM preseason poll. As I said thank you very much to everyone who, who took the time to, to complete it. It was really fascinating and I'm hoping that, hoping that will give us a bit more discussion obviously on the forum as well as, as you can see some of the results here. But Without further ado, let's move on to some of the action and on to the week one recap. Okay, so we've heard a little bit about the uh, the season preview poll from, from you guys getting a reaction on, on how you think your teams will be doing. But of course, week one has happened as of yesterday. So let's talk about some of the storylines that we've had from our very first regular season sim for 2019. And we have to start with probably the biggest result of the the first week and that is none other than the Philadelphia Eagles beating the Super Bowl champions LA Rams in a, an incredibly close game actually 
The Eagles winning by 14 to 10. Really, really surprising result. Um, given the Rams finishing last year on such a huge high, have, uh, have really come back down to a little bit of reality, I think, in this first game of the season. I mean, Terry Bridgewater had a, a subpar game by his his uh, metrics, just in, in terms of his general um, percentage, throwing percentage there. Um, you know, causing a little, maybe there's still a little bit of a hangover in, in the Rams, Rams roster as they enter this season. I mean, the Eagles obviously did have a fantastic year last year and really did stake their claim in terms of the, uh, the division and the playoffs and um, have, have come back into this year with a, a really strong focus to try and get back into the playoffs. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, this was not really the, uh, the prettiest of viewing for either team in terms of offensive style or in terms of a game for the neutral. But there's some things that are really interesting to call out here. Uh, you know, obviously the Rams really heavily focused on on some of the running of the ball. Um, Anderson there with um, some really good good performance from him to be perfectly honest with you, um, proving that uh, he is still one of the uh, the really elite running backs in the league. But it was certainly um, the damage was was really done by the uh, the Eagles here on um, some of some really efficient um, general passing, I would say, and and really just not getting into penalty trouble seems to be one of the main factors in this one. The The running game for the Eagles was, was fairly bare. I mean, Slayton putting up a pretty measly 76 yards, but uh, it, it pretty much came down to just general some general efficient play from from the team here, um, mainly because of uh, some, some okay decent receiving numbers here from Macklin in particular, who we, we talked a lot, a lot about last year in terms of whether he could step up and be that, that one option for the Eagles. Getting off to a fairly good start here, and obviously it was the defense that came out really and and, and got this one over the line with that interception return um, for for them. But surprising result. I don't think many people expected the the Eagles to come out of this one with the win. Um, yeah, maybe a little bit of a hangover, as I said, from the LA Rams perspective. But you know, massive props to Adam and the Eagles for for really putting a a marker down in week one for for them going into this year. So let's talk about some of the other results that were, were interesting um, and some of the things that really, really stood out in week one. I mean, we can't not talk next about the, the Pittsburgh Steelers. So obviously new GM has come in, um, has really made his mark with this team, to be frank. I, I can't remember the last time a, a team in week one put up 60 plus on, a, on an opposition. And wow, it was just a complete bloodbath from from the uh, Colts' perspective. Um, Smith had a, a terrible game, but uh, the entire roster really didn't step up to the mark in this one. And McCoy, the uh, the main man that we, we talked a lot about in the offseason in terms of his move, really came into his own in this one. Four touchdowns, 149 uh, QB rating, really, really putting up crazy, crazy numbers. Four, you know, 328 yards, 66%. Throwing percentage is really, really good. I mean, he does have some really elite options to throw to this year. I mean, Colley, um, Ertz and, and, and uh, Crowder are obviously no, no slouches themselves. And it really did show that that passing game was incredibly efficient in this one. Averaging 15.2 yards per attempt is just phenomenal, really. And as you can see by the, the, you know, the general scoring summary here, it was it was a fantastic game for the Steelers. Uh, really, really su surprising me, I have to say. I, I expected the Steelers, as you've probably seen from my preview, to to not really be in that sort of playoff divisional hunt really this year. I expect them to take a little bit of a step back, just based on the general new GM coming into the CSFL and just you know generally some, some minor adopt adaptions of the team. But if they can keep this performance up. 68 points in your first game is certainly certainly worth talking about and i you know i thoroughly am really pleased to see mccoy doing so well in his first game um really as a as a starter again and uh, I, I i will be watching the steers definitely this sunday to see how they perform in their next game on the the colts perspective i think this is a little bit of a um uh, an early baptism of fire. I know. I know the Colts GM is is is, is new, not just to the league, but to draft day sports pro football. Um, so I would say, you know, there's obviously a lot of um, a lot of things that they can do to sort of improve and learn. And, and certainly, I'm sure that the rest of the league and myself will be be helping them sort of adapt and get used to some of the um, the intricacies of it. And obviously, we're going to talk a little bit later about general playbook and, and strategy and things. So I'd encourage them to have a have a look at that as well. I mean, there was a couple of small bright spots. I would say, if if there if there was any, 
I mean, the, the general um, passing um, rating was, was not too bad in terms of general yardage. It was it was not too awful. The rush game was, was, was just non-existent. Um, but I think predominantly that, that comes down to the fact that this team only had the, the ball for 22 minutes. And, you know, that, that huge differential in terms of plus 15 minutes for the, the Steelers is always going to put you in a bit of a negative situation. So there's obviously some work to do, I think, on both sides of the ball for the Colts. But, you know, it's, it's, it's a learning game. Um, there's still pieces there that can turn this around. It's still only week one. But my goodness me, that Steelers team has come out the traps absolutely flying. Now, let's talk about a couple of other games. I mean, it's it's worth talking probably a little bit about the um, the Dallas Cowboys, who obviously um, have got Cam Newton this season. Really, first proper season with playbooks and and generally, a, you know, building this team probably into a contender. A, a good solid win against the uh, the Forty ers who are probably going to have a bit of a difficult year, I, I think, personally. You know, losing some really key pieces in this in this roster of the 49ers. But, you know, the, the, the Cowboys came out, got their week one win. So uh, good good to see that that's, that started positive, positively for them. I mean, elsewhere, I think it's worth probably a shout out to the Bills, who I, I thought um, will, will probably be one of the teams down the bottom end of this season. But they've put up a really strong performance in this one against the, the Chiefs. And, and fair to say that the Chiefs um, have got a bit of work to do on, on their side of things. But, you know, talking about the Bills, I think the fascinating thing about this one, from my perspective, was that Freeman didn't even play. It was it was Hogan who, who was the starting role for them. Um, you know, the second round pick, who who's, who's actually looks like he's going to develop into a pretty good starting prospect for them. But what does this mean for the Bills situation, in particular Freeman? Um, you know quarterback is probably in his prime at this moment in time lost the starting gig on week one to Hogan who, who put up some really good numbers does this mean that the Bills go with um, Hogan for, for week two or do they revert back to Freeman and give him an opportunity again I don't know but it's really interesting to see that the Bills have got off to a win a winning start um, for this season and then let's talk a little bit about the the Jaguars a team that was um, you know really boasted during free agency and in the offseason they had a really really good period brought in a huge amount of talent to this team and they've got the season off to an absolute blinder beating the Bengals and Dak Prescott is just going from strength to strength I think is fair to say um looking like he's going to be one of the top five quarterbacks in the league over the next you know seven or eight years I'd imagine at least um really really good performance from this team some good numbers on the board um, if anything, I would probably say that the, the rush game needs to be adapted a little bit more. Um, they need to get a bit more out of Javid Best. I think there's still a little bit in the tank for him. Um, if they can get that balance going, they're going to be good. But it's worth saying that their receiving talent is just phenomenal. Um, and they really did stand out in this one. Keller, you know, transitioned over from the Lions. Not missed a beat from this Jags team. Uh, the likes of Royal, Edelman, all of these guys. Green, all really, really, really giving great targets for Dak Prescott in this one. Talking a little bit about the Bengals, tough one to come into in week one. I mean, the Jaguars added so much talent that they were going to be raring to go, I think, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the start of this season. But, you know, there's some positive signs. I mean, they, they did put up 20 points. Um, the defense probably needs a little bit of work. Um, but, you know, they, they did more or less match them in terms of the, uh, the, the receiving game. Um, so th there's some things to take away from this. Um, mistakes were probably one of the costly factors in terms of the fumbles. But, you know, Jones still looking pretty strong. Um, Matt Ryan had an OK game, apart from the interception. But, you know, I think there's maybe on the defensive side a little bit more work that they could probably do in, in this one. But, you know, there's still a positive thing to take away from, from this game. And so in terms of week one, that's a few little things that we've, we've just discussed here. I think um, a lot of people are talking a little bit about the Tampa Bay loss as well, just because of the fact that Aaron Rodgers arrived in Tampa. But I'm, I'm not going to talk too much into this other than say that the Packers got a very good win off the board, um, a team that I think is going to be probably rebuilding this year. But, you know, it's worth saying that we can't really judge this, this Tampa Bay team until Rodgers is back. Once Rodgers is back, if they are losing games like this, then, of course, that will be a storyline for us to talk a little bit about. But, I mean, we can talk a bit about the uh, the Broncos-Dolphins game, which is probably two teams that we, we will expect to be in the um, in the, in the contender front this year on, in the AFC. Um, really, really tough game. Uh, 
bloodbath of a defensive game coming down to sort of, you know, a lot, you know three points in it. Both teams um, really did shut each other down fairly well, though. Um, and you can see that by some of the averages in their rushing and receiving game. So both teams still got, got a way to go, I think, on the offensive side. But defensively, they've come out the gate strong. And I, I fully expect um, both teams to, to be up there or thereabouts this year. And, and this, this game really did validate that, that perspective. And you'll know from my season preview that I do think that um, Jimmy, Jimmy G is probably not as you know not going to be the long-term solution i think in denver but you know we'll see i think ben rolfsberg is going to be a fascinating watch though i i'm i'm still really excited to see how he does in miami i think that's that's such a match made in heaven it's going to be it's going to be one to watch so i think that draws me to a close in terms of the key standouts probably for for this week one um, I'm interested to hear what do you guys think were your week one standouts? What are the things that surprised you? What are the things that you're looking for into week two? But uh, just gives you a little bit of a flavour of some of the crazy, crazy um, things that can happen in the CSFL. And I'm sure we'll be back next week to probably not just talk about week two, but also talk about week three as well and, and see, get a flavour for how the divisions and the conferences are starting to stack up at, at that point. But now let's turn a little bit us our eye a little bit over to you know general tips and tricks. And um, of course, as I said earlier, we're going to be talking a little bit about general strategy, playbooks, um, passing, running, blitzing ratios, all of that thing to come. But before we do that, obviously, we need to go back to our test file and load that up. Okay, so we are of course back in our, our test file here that we used for last week's episode to talk through the various formations and setup of depth charts for your team. But as I said, today we're going to talk a little bit about the strategy tab and in particular how you go about setting up strategy, playbooks and, and that, that type of thing. So the first thing you're going to do when you click on the strategy tab is you're going to arrive at what is the play calling screen. And you'll see if you've um, just joined the league and you haven't set this up before, it will be defaulted to your um, your coach's defense and offense style. So what we will need to do here is obviously we're going to want to be able to have more control of this and be able to talk through how we set this up. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to the play caller and we're going to make this a custom um, for both sides. So what this means is that um, we now have access and the ability to select a playbook once we've created one and also set the the weightings for both offense and defense and it is really in this screen where you have the most amount of customization available to you really based on down and distance situations and where you are and what position of the game this is what really will determine how um, how your team generally tends to play what style they will run um, once you've added the playbooks etc so First thing we're going to do is I'm just going to talk through some of this and we'll come back at the end of this session and just talk through once we've added a playbook how we'll how we'll do that. But we'll talk through the offensive side first. So what you have here is you have what's called a run and, and, and pass weight modifier. So if you hit these little I buttons and the question marks up here, what it does is it gives you a really nice overview of what setups and, and what the various different aspects mean. So we'll start with the run pace pass weight ratio. Obviously, what this means is if you put the number up between 0 to 100, if you go nearer towards 100, you're going to pass more. If you go nearer towards the, the 1 or 0 mark, you're going to run the ball more. So there'll be certain situations, as, as everyone knows, in, in, in football and in your style of play, based on what, what, what your team looks like, that you may want to pass more in a certain situation or run more in a certain, certain situation. So this is really key when you're setting this up to really think about this and think about how your team, how you want your team to operate. There's a caveat that I will put on this um, on both the offense and defensive side in terms of weightings. Each league will have a set of um, options available to them in the commissioners area. And we'll just go and show you this now and just, and just give you a flavor for what this looks like. So if we go into our league options here and we bring this up, what we'll see is um, basically every single league may do this slightly differently. So it's really important that you understand this depending on how you set up your play calling ability. So if we go into the advanced settings here, what you can have is you can have a run and pass ratio modifier, um, so and a yards modifier. So what this essentially does, it de determines 
how effective your play calling is in terms of what weightings. So by default, I would say if your league is running default settings, typically there's a 20% fluctuation based on what you set up. So what this means is if you set your pass modifier for your strategy to 100, it doesn't mean that you are going to play, your, your team is going to run a pass play in every situation for that particular down. It means that there may be about 20% or so that it will, it will still try, you know, the AI will still try and run a, a run play. And um, the reason for that, and the reason why you have these modifiers in sort of the league options, is because there are obviously ways that you can um, can kind of abuse that system really. Um, if you have it full set to, you know, complete pure ratings, it does produce some wacky results if, if you are able to sort of understand that a bit further. So what I would say is it's important you understand what um, what option your, your league is running. Um, obviously in the CSFL we run default, which is why I'm referring to roughly a sort of 20 to 25% um, fluctuation um, from what we've seen in, in our league. But for other leagues it may be different. So it's really important to understand that because you may have a playbook and a strategy and a run weight ratio that works in one league and it doesn't work very well in another league. It could well be because that league option um, for the play calling is slightly different. So heading back to our strategy screen, you know, what we can essentially do here is we can we can weight it, as I said. So, for example, on first and 10, say I have a team where on first and 10, I really want to pound and drive the ball first. I want to try and get some decent yardage with my run play. Um, so I'll, I'll probably put that low. So let's say 15 or so. And you, what you can do is you can set up for every single situation here. And the key thing that most people tend to ask me is, well, what does it mean by sort of, um, you know, a medium situation, a long situation, a short situation? And this is where the question mark up here is really, really useful because it gives you some of this narrative. So as I can say, you know, it's, it's describing that pass rating, you know, it doesn't mean 100%, but also the distances are listed. So a short situation is 0 to 3 yards, a medium situation is 4 to 6 yards, and a long is 7 plus yards. So you can set up your style of when you want to run or pass more often based on, on those yardage sessions. And it's really, really useful to understand that. And we'll talk a bit about blitzing in a second when we get to defense. If we move down, obviously there's a goal line setting. There's also a half um, time sort of game winning situation, a half losing situation. So what this will do if you have this switched on for those three settings is it means that every time you get to the goal line, it's going to adopt that particular playbook and that particular run pass weighting. Doesn't matter down situation at all. Same with the, um, the game winning and game losing situations. It, if you have this switched on, what it does is it will default and it will run that particular playbook and that particular pass run situation on any down situation and any, any um, yard, yardage situation based on whether you are winning or losing after half time. So personally, my view is I ignore those situations. I, I have a goal line set up for my team. I have a goal line playbook that we run, but I will ignore the half time because I don't want my playbook and my strategy to just run for half a game. Regardless of whether I'm winning or losing, I want to still play the same strategy I, throughout that entire game as much as possible. So I would I would tick these and just ignore them. So moving on to defense, it's a similar type of thing in terms of you know your blitz weighting. The higher the number means more blitzing, the lower the number means less blitzing, between 0 to 100. Um, what I will say is, key thing to remember is because um, the CSFL does not allow custom plays, you can't create custom blitz situations. So when we get to the playbook in a bit, you'll kind of see this, but what it happens on a blitz situation is the game will select a blitz based on the types of formations that you have and based on the coach preference. So you'll get different types of blitzes that you don't have control over. So it's really important to remember that, that you won't have that control, but you'll be running a blitz play in that situation if it's selected. So. Obviously, there's a risk and reward with blitzing, as everyone knows. Um, you know, more opportunities to cause interceptions, cause sacks, cause general disruption on the um, on the opposition offense. But obviously, there is a an, a little bit of a randomness because it does um, depend on what types of blitz packages are being selected by by the AI for your team. So just to bear that in mind, and obviously you'll you'll want to have make sure you have the right personnel to run that type of strategy. And we have seen the CSFL on the defensive side. Really, really heavy blitz teams do unbelievably well and win championships. We've seen teams that don't blitz really that much and win championships. There's no real set way of doing it, but it's just worth noting that that is the variance. And like the offensive side, you can obviously ignore goal line, end of half, end of game um, situations. Um, 
and, and down to your preference as to whether you want to do that or not. So as you see here, it sort of gives you an idea of sort of saying that the, the things I've just listed. So if you do want to refer back to what I've just described in terms of play calling, this question mark is really useful. I've essentially just, just run through this um, to, 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 to date on this, in this show. So that's how offensive play calling works. As I said, we'll come back and we'll talk a bit more about this once we set up a playbook. But let's go to the game planning section which is another section that I get asked an awful lot about in terms of how to set up, what styles um, I run and, and how I tend to think about this. So the first thing to note is that, again, if you're new and you've just joined in, in the, the AI and the coach is running your, your strategy, this will be all great, grayed out like this. So the way we can unselect this is you can see here in, in game plan, I don't have this option. So I have to go to create new game plan. And you can see all of a sudden everything opens up. So I can obviously name this as much as uh, whatever I want. I can delete game plans. I can, you know, add as many game plans as I want. The key thing to remember here is that once I make changes here, and if I want to go and edit it in the future, I have to create a new game plan. The positive thing of this is though, if I go new game plan two, for example, oh, I can type two, um, it will just, appear and it will basically give you a set of options um, based on, on what was there previously. So, you know, you don't need to sort of start from scratch as such, but it's worth remembering you can't edit game plans once they've been created. So you have to create it and then, um, you know, create a new one every time you want to possibly change something. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the settings you have here and what it essentially brings to your team. Um, and, and what what situations you might want to use certain things. So if we talk about the offensive game plan to begin with, so in the attitude se section, you've got aggressive, balanced, and conservative. And what this essentially means is it, it, get, it determines a couple of things. It impacts penalties. So if you are more aggressive, you're likely to get more penalties against you it, versus conservative. If you um, want to go for it more in fourth down situations, Obviously, the more aggressive you are, the more the AI is going to call that situation. That does mean, though, that you will obviously have that risk that there, it runs a fourth and fourth down situation in a particularly risky area of the field, and we have seen that. So, whilst it's you know can give you a situation where you do get more opportunities, um, there are some, some negative sides to an aggressive style. But it, you know, obviously, it does mean, mean you get the reward of being an aggressive style, so you do get those opportunities available to you. If we talk about the the focus, obviously this is, is fairly straightforward. I mean, essentially what this does is it, it, it affects the success rate of those types of play situations. So if you want more success on running the ball or more success on passing the ball, um, you can select those. Balanced obviously just keeps it fairly neutral, but you know it's, it's worth thinking about this on two fronts, I think personally. One, if you're in a situation where you're against a team that's particularly bad against a certain type of you know, play setup, be it running or passing. If more success on that against a team that's weak on that is always a great opportunity to utilize that. Likewise, you could use it on the other factor. So if your team is already a pretty good passing team and not particularly good at running the ball, you know, you might want to change that, that focus to running the ball and get a bit more success there. Me personally, I use this based on the opposition's weakness and I tweak this as, as we go through, depending on, on game by game situations. Moving on to the tempo. So this really just affects clock, clock, clock consumption for your offense. So if you want to be a quick hit and out type of offense, you can go to a very fast setting. If you want to be at the type of team that slows the ball down, really takes its time, utilizes all of the clock that it has available, then you can go to a very slow setting. And obviously you can tweak that based on, on, on in between. There's some advantages to doing both. Um, obviously, if you go very slow, you churn a lot of the clock. It uh, means the opposition has, in theory, less of the ball. But it does mean that you are a little bit more pragmatic in approach. Whereas if you go very fast, you might possibly um, chew less clock. So more opportunities to possibly um, you know, get the ball back. Uh, more opportunities to possibly catch opposition at offside and with penalties and things like that. So moving on to... Uh, so passing preference, fairly straightforward this one, um, determines sort of what type of distance you're kind of looking to primarily throw the ball. Um, it again, similar to the, um, the focus, it impacts the success rate of those particular types of plays. 
So if you want to be a long gunning team and you want more success at throwing the ball long, you can go long, short or medium. And we've seen different styles work very well. Um, our, our site, Terry Bridgewater, probably has, sets up short, whereas someone like an, an, an Alex Smith might go long, for example, in terms of quarterbacks we've seen in the league. Um, passing target, um, it affects really the targeting of players with a sort of a minor, minor bonus to those types of players. So if you want more um, opportunities for your tight end and more success for your tight end, you can put them in. Um, obviously, throwing it balanced outside is depending on what right wide receivers are there. But you can sort of use that to focus on, on there. Um, primary receiving pretty much affects the number of targets that receiver is going to get. So if you want a particular receiver to have more targets in a game, um, you, can, you can select that particular person. Obviously, you can also select, I think, running backs and tight ends here as well, if you want that type of style. Um, really good if you uh, have a particular receiver who is elite versus the other ones and you want them to have more opportunities to catch and more opportunities to, to get you yardage you can obviously use it for that situation a third down back is a really interesting one that was added in draft day sports pro football 22 and um, really what that does is it just puts that running back in third down situations so you might have a guy who's really good at short yardage um, from, from running back perspective, but you might not want them necessarily for some of the first down situations where there's a little bit more space to play with. And you can you can basically determine who that is now. And it's been proven to be really effective and it keeps certain running backs quite fresh through the game and, and utilizes a different type of skill set really to just having a default running back. So interesting one to see, and we, we've seen that work fairly effectively over, this, over the, uh, the last season or so. Um, the same with um, with the goal line. It just defaults to the guy in sort of goal line situations who's going to be your running back. So you know, same same setup there to consider. Uh, in terms of the uh, the running focus, basically what this does is it gives a small bonus to the running type that you you select. So if you want to be more inside outside, you know, more draws, more three wide receiver sets, it gives a small bonus to those types of sets that you want to run. Um, and again, in terms of the, the running back role, it basically um, gives a small increase again um, to that type of performance. So if you've got, if you want your running back running mainly, um, you know, it gives a small bonus to his running ability versus blocking or catching. And you, you know, you can, you can determine based on that. Same with the, um, the tight end role, um, similar types of thing gives a small bonus to there. And you can obviously select a backfield by committee, which balances more of the, um, the distribution between your running backs. If you've got two or three guys who are really elite, you could probably do that and keep them more fresh through the game. Um, it really depends on your depth and situation. And then finally on offense, you have a, a QB tuck and run. I mean, pretty much says what it does on the tin. It, it, it affects the likelihood of your quarter pack to, to be running on a foul pass play. So say the pass play breaks down, the Q, QB's got a running opportunity determines how often they're going to try and do that. So you can probably see already on the offensive side, there is an awful lot you can customize to give your, your team fairly small amounts of bonuses, small amounts of, of slight changing and adapting to strategy. I mean, my, my view is there's some things in here you might want to set just for every single game, like your back situations, your passing target receiver focuses, but there's other things in terms of your general focus, you, you know, maybe your tempo, um, that you might want to tweak on a game by game basis. So if we move over to the, the defense side, similar types of types of thing really to talk about, but for an attitude, it's, it's primarily the same thing, except on the defensive side, this really affects your ability to tackle, fumbles, missed tackles, interceptions, and penalties. So, you know, more aggressive will, will most likely result in more penalties, but you might get more of an opportunity for fumbles and interceptions. But if you go conservative, less penalties, but there's more less opportunity to cause that chaos probably and get those fumbles and, and interceptions that you might want. So again, it really depends on the type of defensive roster you've got. Whether you're a bend or break style of roster, or you're more of an aggressive chaos determining type of type of, of type of defense. On the focus, you've obviously got the same type of thing um, as the offensive game, but obviously on the defensive side. This affects sort of bonuses and penalties based on those situations. So if you're more, um, you know, think the opposition is going to be probably more pass heavy for the your next game, you might want to focus more on the pass versus the run, for example. Moving on to the primary coverage, what this essentially does is it affects the, the performance of the players in that coverage type. So if you run a zone, um, it will basically give you a small little um, buff 
to your zone type plays that you run versus your man or your mixed and and vice versa for the other settings mixed kind of is a balance between two gives a little bit of a, a bonus for both same with the uh, defensive line but obviously it's now focused on pass rush or run support again you know you might want to tweak the coverage and line rolls based on the opposition you're playing and um, you might you know for example if you're playing against a team that's very very good on the ground you might want more, more run support but you might want more pass rush if you're playing against a good passing team my my general view of this is i tend to run more pass rush because most of the teams in the csfl are very pass heavy but um there are a couple of teams that do um, use the running game very well that i might mix it up for so i, I would say generally i keep it a pass but tweak it on on the game by game based on on what you're seeing um, and the same with the linebacker role except it's coverage and run support if we move on to the um the player radio now this is a really interesting one so what this does is this gives a um no essentially gives the radio to the defender but um it basically gives your um defense an opportunity to um basically improve decision making for, for for the team so based on the situation whether it's they need to be you know, set up for a run for a pass and um, basically helping you to to determine how best to sort of recognize plays and defend that play so my suggestion here is really to go with um, a, a player who's got good iq um, and that will hopefully help determine um you know passing some of this iq check that happens as part of this particular setup to enable you to determine um, your defense to determine what type of play it is a little bit more effectively and basically you know helps to defend the, the situation um, more robustly than than it would be otherwise so that would be my tip with, with, with that one so we move on to the match cbs to wide receivers so as it says here essentially what it does is if it basically will attempt to make sure there's enough cornerbacks on the field as there are wide receivers so it will default obviously to things like 335 nickel and dime plays um, if there's an, a shotgun offense or four wide receiver sets being used by by the offense my personal view on this is to untick this the reason i say this is because this is very very easy to spot if a defense is playing this through um through general scouting and in any, any multiplayer league if anyone identifies this it's very very easy to abuse it, that this type of thing because basically what it does is it weakens your ability in sort of the midfield um, so I would turn this off and that would be my suggestion turn it off don't use it it's, it's a very ineffective um, for, for multiplayer leagues in particular and then obviously down the bottom here we've got our line man coverage um, this essentially affects where the, the, the defense um, lines up to cover receivers whether you want them to always line up whether you want it balanced or never to line up um, I don't really have a massive view on this I think it really depends on what types of um, you know defenders you've got out there how quick they are and agile they are to adapt to situations really just depends that one and then finally you have a, a target player so what this is this is a, um, a situation you tweak on a game by game basis um, unless you leave it as auto but what this does is it essentially gives you your defense a player to focus on um, on the offensive side so a particular player you might want to shut down or stop from getting yardage or getting situations you can set it up so for example if i want alvin kamara to probably have more focus on him because i don't want him getting 200 odd yards in terms of rushing yards i can select him and that will basically hopefully mean that um, we'll be able to reduce some of his impact during the game and then finally down the bottom here similar to the play calling section you have a winning and losing override so this basically gives an override to if you are winning or losing do you want to run more pass more or just only run and just only pass um, my preference again and my recommendation would be not to have this on um, because it just basically overrides everything it, it, it makes you more far more predictable and it can lead to um, probably some questionable decision making by by the ai as you go through that that override so you know it might be situations where you're actually like one yard off of um, possibly making that that third down situation and it might still try and pass the ball if you are you know losing for example when you've got it set to only pass i i my personal preference is i still want my playbook and my actual game strategy to play out throughout the entire game regardless of whether i'm winning or losing so that would be my suggestion is probably have it at none and don't use it but you know you can obviously play with it and see if you've got a particular quarterback you think if i just give him the reins and let him pass the ball if we're we're losing 
and make things happen, then that's best situation. But my personal preference and my suggestion is to have that both of those set at none. So that brings us on to the, the playbooks. Um, let's have a little chat about this. Um, so in terms of playbooks in the CSFL, um, the league allows you to create custom playbooks, but not custom plays. So you're not able to create a play um, from scratch and import it and use that in your playbook. But you can create any number of playbooks as you as you want. Some people will say have just one offensive playbook, one defensive playbook, and just use those for every single play calling situation. Some will say have playbooks for every single type of situation, and there'll be like twenty or thirty playbooks they use uh, based on situation, based on opposition. I'm going to just talk through the basics of how you set up a playbook and how you'd look at it in terms of play calling and how you'd probably analyze it. And hopefully that'll give you just some building blocks to kind of start with. Um, of course, if you have questions on playbooks and generally how to set them up, how to analyze them, how to do the more in-depth stuff that's maybe a little bit more, um, you know, second level, I would say, than, than what I'm describing here, ask people on the Discord server, chat to, chat to people, reach out to anyone. I'm sure that people are more than willing to help people think about how to design this because it's one of those things that, People are constantly iterating, constantly thinking about how this works and constantly um, adapting it. And, and it's something that probably will continue through, not just this version of Draft Day Sports Pro Football, but future versions as well. So in order to create a playbook, I'm gonna click the Create Playbook button and I'm gonna name it. So I'm gonna call this my Offense 1 Setup. And of course, it's going to be an offensive style. I'm not gonna create a defensive one for this. Um, so I'm gonna hit Save New Playbook. And what comes up immediately is obviously my playbook has not got any plays in it at the moment, so I need to add some. So I'm going to go to the add play to playbook. And what this does is this brings up a new menu where you can basically look at every play that this game has and determine whether you want to add it to your playbook or not. So it's worth probably saying if we go back that um, some leagues will have certain numbers of minimum plays you have to have in a playbook. And again, this reason is because obviously you could set up a playbook that has all pass, all run plays, and that really does um, start to sort of limit um, the, the sort of variability that you kind of want in in a league um, in terms of play calling. So, you know, it might be different, but just keep an eye out for this. So for this particular default setup I've got here, it's got to have 10 run plays and 10 pass plays. So we're gonna go back into add a play to playbook, and I'm gonna look for, let's say I want to look for a run play, that's uh, in an eye formation and you can see here it's already started to filter down every single run eye formation play i have and if i click on it it brings up the play you know icon sort of graphic here and gives me a flavor for what that play really is so obviously a uh, an eye formation counter right is a count you know counter right play um it's a run obviously it's a balance type and it's in an in sort of a pro style setup so you know, you can see and get a flavor for that. Do I want that type of play in my playbook? So I'm going to just say, yes, I want that play in my playbook. And obviously what that does, it adds it in there. It adds the frequency, the play weight at one. We'll talk about that in a minute once we've added some plays. But let's just go through and let's just add in um, a bunch of um, different run plays just so we can get up to that 10. Obviously, I mean, in an ideal set, you probably want a set of different plays based on different formation types because you don't want to be predictable. Um, but we're just we're just going to go through. I'm just going to quickly chuck in a, enough to make up ten, and I'm going to do the exact same with a pass play. So obviously you've got different formation types. You've also got wishbone for those of you who are really into, interested in that. Before wide receiver sets, you know you can obviously run a few of those. Um, we might want to run I don't know, let's say a couple of spread situations, and and obviously what you'll see as I'm clicking through is that on the pass plays there's some more options here so what it does it gives you more of an idea of what type of um situation this would run so you know in terms of distribution it's balanced so it's worth remembering some of these things because when you talk about the game planning you know we talked about distribution you know if you're going to have a bonus to long plays you might want to run more long plays than probably more balanced or short plays for example um you know if you've got your tight ends predominantly sort of catching your running backs blocking, you want to probably set up your bonuses to, to correspond to that. Um, but obviously for, for this, I'm just I'm just adding some plays. I'm not really too worried about um, any of this at this moment in time, but it's worth bearing in mind if you do set up um, a, a playbook going forward. 
So we've got all our play, plays in here. I've set them all up at frequency one. Um, let's go back out of this and go over to back to sort of the general custom playbook section. So you'll see I've got an offensive one playbook in here now, which is added. And you can see it's all listed down here. So what you will see is you'll see the type of play, what it is, and the sort of the general frequency of it. So you can obviously change these weightings. So for example, in a playbook, I might have 20 plays, but let's say I want to run the four wide receiver quick slant a little bit more. And you can see here, it gives a percentage of the frequency that it's gonna run in that playbook against that. So I've, I've moved it up to a three, and that means that basically 25% of the time in this playbook is gonna run this four wide receiver quick slants. So, you know, I might want that. I might wanna run the play action dump off a bit more as well. And you can see it automatically sort of gives us a little bit of a weighting and, and sort of calculates that through based on if it's running a pass situation. So it's important to remember that these frequency percentages are not the frequency of the entire playbook, but the frequency of that pass or run situation that, that's determined. So for example, all the runs, I haven't obviously selected any sort of frequencies. They're all gonna run at 10% of the time if I if a run play is, is generally selected for this playbook. So that's really interesting to keep an eye on. It gives you a flavor for how you probably want to weight your playbook. Um, also, there's some interesting stats here to consider. So obviously the number of times the play is called, what it, the game will do is it will just calculate that for your team through the season. Average gain, your number of touchdowns you've scored with it and your interceptions that you've conceded with it. So it will give you a flavor for whether your team is actually performing fairly well in that play situation. Obviously, it doesn't give you the details of the down and, and yardage situation. You'd have to do a little bit more sort of data analysis individually on your team, probably game by game to get that information. But it gives you a quick snapshot. Of, okay. Well, this, this play's working really well. I mean, I'm getting 5.6 yards from it. I've run it 10 times this season and I scored a touchdown. That's not too bad for, the, for that particular play. So maybe I want to run that a little bit more than maybe I've, I've had in here originally. And you can sort of tweak this through the season and you can see how you can start, start to wind down and wind up your playbook based on how your team's performing. And of course, you can also add a new playbook for a... Um, Oh, hang on, add a new playbook for a, a defense as well. So we can just call this one defense one and add a defensive playbook. And you can see here, there's no minimum in terms of the defensive plays for this setup I've got. They might be in, in your league, it's worth just remembering that. And you can see here, basically I can set up what type of defense based on run or pass, what formation set, and then I get a flavor for, you know, what type of defense it is, what the focus is, what the coverage is gonna be, and what the linebackers are doing in that particular situation. So again, you probably want to tie some of your bonuses in your game planning scenario to your playbook that you're running. But once you've created your playbook, there's a couple of th really useful things to do. One is I would always suggest once you've created it, export the playbook, because what the hell do is it will store it outside of the game in case, for example, you forget to save or, you know, you come back and it's disappeared, etc. So always export it once you've created it. So you've got somewhere and then you can always re-import it back in, which is really useful to remember. So definitely do that. And then obviously you'll want to probably add this to your play calling. So if you go back to your play calling scenario, you can see now I have a drop down of that offensive playbook. So I can select it. And obviously I can select it for every single type of situation or just the ones that I want. And you know, you can tweak that as, as much as you want. Um, and what that'll do is hopefully that combined with changing your waiting limits here to your, your different situations, tweaking your game planning, adding to your formation sets that we talked about last week with your depth charts, you can hopefully now start to build a picture of the sheer amount of customization that is available in, in this game. And you know, even just scratching the surface of this, you know, you'll start to see some really interesting developments for your team and what works and what doesn't work. And as I said, you can refine this and spend absolutely hours and hours and hours of time looking at this. And it really is fascinating when you get into it and you're you know, designing these strategies against human, human players and they're also doing the exact same thing. And you can see how that clash of style thought really does bear into sort of the weightings of how the, uh, how the, how the game performs and what the results are. But I hope that that's giving you a little bit of a sense of how you can kind of set these things up. And as I said, please just drop conversations in the Discord server, ask questions if you're new with this, 
about how to design this, how to sort of continue to reiterate this, because there's plenty of guys in, in the CSFL who have been doing this for a long time and have a really good understanding for this and are more than happy to sort of share how they've approached um, building out playbooks, building out game planning based on the rosters they have available. And, you know, it may take a little while to, to kind of get to that level, but it certainly is once you get to that, that perspective, it really, when you start to see the, the results of the hard labor of work, it really is um, something to be, um, to be, be behold, really. So please, you know, take a look, go for it. Hopefully refer back to this, look at um, the, the information that's available and um, you know, hopefully this will help in terms of the evolution of, of uh, building out your, your design and strategy for your team. All right, it's that time of the show where we find out who was last week's CSFL GM Bytes. But of course, before we do that, let's listen to the recording again. Get your last minute guesses in and we will reveal all in a moment. You are listening to the GM Bite on the CSFL kickoff show. Okay, did you manage to guess it correctly? It was none other than our very own Cleveland Browns GM, Jedi. Jedi, thank you very much for taking the, uh, the time to, to, to give us the audio. Um, it was a tough one this week, I think. Um, tough, tough one to guess. I know we had a, a few, few different guesses for that one. But that does mean now that we can obviously find out who this week's CSFL GM Byte is going to be. Let's listen to that recording now. You are listening to the GM Byte on the CSFL kickoff show. Okay, as always, guys, get your guesses into the server and... Uh, Let's find out who it is next week. That does, of course, bring us to the close of this week's episode. Thank you very much for joining me and talking through reaction to season previews, uh, talking a little bit about the, the week one craziness that happened. But we are fully into the regular season now, and I'm sure we will be back next week to talk about the major storylines that have been going on through the CSFL. As always, guys, have a great day and we will catch up next week.